AI is going to change music, but how? Will it enhance creativity? Will it undermine music itself? Or will it allow musicians to reach an entirely new art form? Since AI tools have become more publicly available, they've largely focused on helping artists and creators generate new music, like Suno, which allows you to create full songs through text prompts. AIVA, a personal assistant that allows full control to edit generated songs. And most notably in recent weeks, Google DeepMind's Lyria, which has launched their impressive artist AI tools that allow you to even hum an instrumental riff and use AI to replace it with the instrument to build layers of a song to demonstrate ideas. There are many positive examples of AI tools to expand creative possibilities, but there are many concerns being raised by artists and rights holders. Last year, a Drake and Weekend song was released that turned out to be an AI deepfake. And there have been many more released since then because AI enables fans to make songs using their favorite artists' voices and materials. But how is this possible? Many say that the most popular AI platforms were trained illegally and that artists aren't getting paid appropriately for their work. Another theme is that AI is making music creation so public that it devalues music. Just today, so we're recording this on April 2nd, 2024, the US-based organization, the Artist Rights Alliance, brought together more than 200 artists to sign a public letter to stop devaluing music in the face of concerns that music will just become content. There's another ongoing conflict happening on TikTok where Universal pulled all their music in hopes of negotiating an appropriate payment structure. Music is one of the first and most visible battlegrounds of the old internet versus this next evolution coming as a result of AI. Yeah, it's basically a continuation of the struggle that was, you know, lit on fire in many respects by digital stream platforms like Spotify and, and Apple and Tidal, where they basically took a huge catalog of music and made it all accessible. It really disrupted the entire model of music, uh, but it's been great for consumers. So AI might do the same thing. It might be a boom for consumers. It might be a boom for content creators and, and fans. But at the same time, what does it mean to the industry? What does it mean to sustainability? What does it mean to the act of music itself? Um, you know, at the same time this summer, there was ongoing contract disputes and strikes in the film industry and, and TV industry. And a lot of it resulted, of, you know, was based on the same issue at hand, which is, well, what happens if you use my image without my authorization? Who who should earn off that? Uh, what does it mean? What doesn't it mean? So we're entering a new era of what uh, digital entities, um, the value of them and what they mean will be. So it'll be fascinating to talk, talk to our guests today. Yeah, and from a product perspective as well, I think it's important to remember that there's also a whole other side of this conversation around how does it, how does AI empower and enable um, you know, better use of the business of making music as well for these sort of smaller and mid-sized artists. Um, so I'm really excited today. We're going to be speaking with Martin Walraven Freeling. Um, he is the co-editor of Music X. He has been at the forefront of conversations around the future of music for a while now. Um, the Music X newsletter has taken on topics around digital streaming platforms, rights ownership, and the difficult business of just being a musician. Um, we're going to discuss the value of music in this new future and how AI tools can both benefit and challenge the industry. Yeah, I, I had a wonderful chat with Martin uh, last week, and I'm really excited to dive into these topics with him. The Music X newsletter has really tried to open minds in terms of how music could transform both good and bad. And when we look at it from the product perspective, the tools that you put out into the market right now could be absolutely mind-blowing. They could really transform creativity as a whole, but what are the unintended consequences downstream from those things? Who would have known that Napster was gonna change the industry so much? And who would have known that, that Spotify was gonna be such a transformational force? So we're at that inflection point and Martin's gonna help us see what some of those potential futures could look like. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. Thanks, everybody. I feel honored to have uh, Martin joining us. So he's the co-editor at Music X, which is uh, high rent to him, but he's also a lecturer and the co-CEO of Symphony Media. So Martin, you touch on music in a lot of ways. When did you decide I want to be a Baroque musician too? 
<laughs> I'm definitely not a musician. That's the thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, uh, super happy to be here on the podcast with you. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, fun fact, I, I don't play an instrument. N not a broke musician in that sense. Um, very happy to, to listen to and experience other people, you know, pouring their heart and soul into making that music and have uh, for a very long time wanting to think about sort of how that works um, from a philosophical perspective, from a business perspective, from a psychological perspective, from many different perspectives, which is not as an actual yeah. creator. And I'm actually personally very excited about a lot of the A tools because I can actually be involved in music in ways that I never could before. Even with my own daughter now, it's easy to just pull up YouTube videos and it's easier to learn music than ever before. You have so much more access to so many more tools. But today we're going to be talking about whether that's good or bad. Now, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, jumble up the conversation and, and summarize that way too quickly here. But in terms of how I, re I first learned about Music X, uh, Brittany and I were actually doing a project with, with Spotify to figure out how to uh, increase revenue for artists who were not getting um, appropriately paid, let's say, because of the changes in the music industry and your name and Music X's name kept coming up as people at the forefront of thinking about uh, redistributing rights, different models, you know, integrating WebEx or Web3 and such. So how did you get into all this? It's how that works, right? I mean, it's, um, I did a PhD in history, um, but it was about the history of sound. So still sort of music related. I was, I was going to start, uh, like the starting point for my PhD was that I was going to look at um, street musicians in the late 19th century. Then, you know, as a historian, you go to the archive and you find a lot of other stuff. So it became about sound more, much more broadly speaking. Um, and from there, I um, decided not to really pursue a career in academia. And I ended up working for TV channels, one for classical music and one for jazz music. Um, and that's how I kind of made my way more broadly into the music business. Um, firmly from the distribution side, um, but with a, a healthy interest in all of the other parts as well. Then in 2020, Bas, Bas Grasmeyer, who founded Music X, um, he did Music X Corona, um, which became a daily digest of all the news around the pandemic. And um, at that point, he said, this is a lot of work. Can somebody come and help me? And I said, yeah, I'll come and help you. I, I do this all the time for my colleagues, but they don't really seem to appreciate it that much. <laughs> um, so I might as well do it for an audience that appreciates it. So that's how I got started with, with Music X. It's been a great opportunity to organize my thoughts around stuff and um, uh, led me into uh, you know great communities such as Water and Music um, and many, many others. I guess the whole idea about what it what does it what does it mean to be an artist and how do we kind of make a living from that um has changed of course with every technology that ever you know touches production to distribution and the internet has been a big one there and of course we have the optimistic long tail um story that we've all known and heard um a thousand true fans became a hundred super fans um, but how how do you find them when you engage with these kind of new technologies and AI is definitely the one of the moment, um, it's important to understand within the context of everything else you have to do, right? So if you are an artist nowadays, you have to run your social media, you have to create the music, you have to know how to distribute it. You have to sort of know where to, um, uh, which CMOs to tell what to, um, organize your metadata, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot to do. And, um, I think it's important to, as a, as a sort of music industry, um, which should probably also be plural music industries, um, to figure out how we can kind of make sure that that distribution is pretty fair and even, um, and that everybody has the same access to it. Yeah. You know, I find personally that, um, in the work that you're doing, you and your team rarely shy away from some big conversations and some big call outs when it comes to technology in particular. So previously, I would say like a year, year and a half ago, it was really about Web3 and um, what all of that means and now really digging into the AI side of things. What is your ideal goal that you know these musicians and people in the music industries are taking away by broaching these conversations that others seem to be really scared of having right now? That's a great question. So 
I think by um, by taking all of this head on, um, artists and especially independent artists and a lot of the people that work with them and that support them, that they understand what is out there and what it could mean for them um, and how to integrate it into their existing workflows, right? Because if you if you run six social media channels <clears throat> and create your music and you organize your own tours and all of that stuff, um, and if you're like a booker who helps them, um, and if you're a manager who helps them, et cetera, et cetera, then um, you have to do all of the standard stuff, right? You have to understand why you're doing it. You have to understand what you're doing. And then you think, oh, you know, I can also engage with AI, avatars, Web3, you name it. Um, how do I do that? And if I do that, how do I make sure that I don't just focus on the new thing and drop everything else? That's the, the big thing that I would like people to take away. Yeah. Web2 really enabled scale to happen, social networks reaching out across the world. And for music in particular, you, know, you talked about street musicians where they can engage one-on-one, -on -one, they can engage solely through performance and their own acts. Uh, Web2 and this next version, whatever you want to call it, has made them an enterprise of their own. What are some of the challenges that you've heard from musicians who've had to make this transition from you know, writer slash performer slash curator to someone who now is a business? It's hard because for a lot of them, it's not really in them as a person to have that kind of business aspect um, to the way they approach the world. We can also talk about sort of the impact that musicians as creators now have um, on the, the the way that people move around sort of the digital spaces, right? Um, and <clears throat> for a lot of them, they can understand sort of that they have this impact, but how to take advantage of it is the is another thing. And that's where, um, where I think the understanding of all the tools that are out there is uh, super important. Now, at the beginning of this, um, Brittany introduced a, a couple of tools that are out in market right now for AI. And I'd, I'd love to get your take on whether you think they actually ha might have some impact. So, Britt, what are some of the tools that excited you? What are the tools versus what excited me, I think, is a different question. Um, but there is definitely, I think, a ton that are really making waves right now when it comes to music generation, especially around, um, you know, trying to be, let's call it the chat GPT of music. Um, you know, Suno is the biggest one. It's the first set of all of the you know, since, so A16Z um, and Jason Horowitz, they actually are starting to monitor all of these different tools and seeing what are the top 50 AI-based tools that are being used. And soon as the first music one that has made it into the top 50. So that's definitely the biggest, most vocal one right now. Um, but, you know, I think that there's going to just be a ton of copycats of that one right now. And, and that's also... I think kind of sitting in that problematic space where people are saying, well, what is it being tested on? Where, you know, what is it being trained on? How are we knowing that we're doing the right thing? Um, and then, you know, you go all the way through to you've got the ones that are trying to be really, uh, let's call it ethical, right? Like OpenAI actually originally had a tool for music called Jukebox that they were building in 2019 and 2020, where they were trying to train it on um, on specific artists. And that just sort of died, it's by the wayside. Um, but what are your thoughts? Because there's also a lot of different categories that we can touch on in a second, but look, before we do that, you know, what is your take on that music generation side of the AI tools? They're a lot of fun. That's for sure. Um, the amount of people that I hear, you know, who are having a lot of fun playing around with Suno is great. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, if you're in music, that you understand these things and that you play around with them. Um, <clears throat> as with a lot of large models, um, it's very unclear <laughs> what the training data is for, um, for Suno um, and goes to the heart of everything that the music industry is because everything that we are is built on copyright and there are a lot of problems around copyright um and that's namely that everything that is new gets bolted on to stuff that already exists um uh the actual creation i'm not sure that these things do anything right um i don't think they help i don't think they democratize anything they they just make it super easy, but we've been on a journey to make 
music creation easy with creator tools for like the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Um, and um, we've in, in like, as, as a music industry, we haven't really had our, our Instagram moment to call it that in, in quotation marks, um, where, you know, with Instagram, we have a billion people who suddenly can make great looking photos, even when our phone cameras weren't that good yet because of this filter that was being put on it. <clears throat> um, and with music, you know, that's starting to happen. And I mean, when Boomi came out and decided that you could publish your songs and, you know, distribute your songs to DSPs, it sounded really fun. And then it became a lot of songs and then it became less fun. <laughs> um, and I think we'll get there with all of the, you know, text to audio prompts, music creation stuff like Suno and everything else. I think we're building towards an avalanche of content instead of, you know, these places where you can discover great music. I'm wondering how did the music industry overcome this the last time that it was a, a crisis? And that notably would have been when hip hop came out and samples became a thing. So historically, how did they get through that quandary? Um, they have and they haven't, right? I mean, introducing by DJ Shadow is not on any DSP. <laughs> um, so um, I think the big difference is that um, it was all essentially still the same thing. Um, we kind of knew what we were dealing with. And um, now I don't think we know what, what we're dealing with. So I don't think we have, we can do that same bolting on again that we did before. Um, so we desperately need to have proper discussions with the tech companies about how to deal with collective rights management. Um, and that's not happening. <laughs> it's, and it's just, it's just not happening, right? Yeah. They're not talking to anybody and it's a problem. So maybe to look forward, let's look back at the most recent five years. DSPs, um, you know, music industry just announced that revenues are growing internationally, emerging markets are surging. It all looks quantitatively good, but the reality when I interview artists and artist management teams, um, they're worried about the amount of effort, that touring's um, unsustainable, that they're desperately looking for other revenue sources, that while it's easier to get your music out, there's so much noise out there, that uh, algorithmic you know, playlists have really been a, a boom for discovery, but nonetheless, it's hard to get organic reach anymore. It's hard to get real fans. It's hard to monetize those fans. Is AI just going to accelerate these problems or do you see it perhaps opening up new opportunities, something that's good for the business of being a musician? Um, yes and yes. <laughs> so it will, it will exacerbate the problem um, to no end um, because it, it's become so easy to distribute your music, right? So, so you can pump everything out there um, and it will hit DSPs and these things all, you know, run on algorithms. So the algorithms will just listen to what's out there um, and throw stuff together. Um, but yes, it also creates new opportunities. Um, and one of the things is, um, for example, that artists get a closer, get closer to having a seat at the table for how things are built and how things are organized. So there's a lot of really cool um, AI-based music tech startups that have artists at the, at the table. Um, and that's sort of the thing that excites me the most, right? I mean, if you look at Endless um, or Voice Swap are just two examples that are yeah. very good at that. So, so question on that, you mentioned getting a seat at the table. Um, Brittany mentioned YouTube and now they have like a music council, uh, a classical musician that I'm very fond of, Max Richter is listed on there. What is he getting out of this? Like what, what is, is it influence or is it enabling him to reach new creative potentials? I have no idea, but I mean, it's, it's fun to speculate. Um, I don't know if he gets paid. If he gets paid, he gets money for it. Um, he gets status, I guess. Um, and yeah, perhaps he gets a say, he gets influence on certain, certain decision-making processes. One thing that I'm 
fascinated by about what you said around, you know, people's access to creating music, but also about, you know, what's going to end up happening from a rights management management position. Um, so when you look at some of these tools, I haven't looked at the terms and conditions for all of them, but when I am looking at them, especially these um, more consumer based ones, it seems like the licensing or the ability to even earn money off of something that is in part AI generated seems to be tied to an active subscription to the tool with which it was made on. And yeah. to me, that so if you feels use like a free version switch. of Suno. If you're listening to this and you use the free version of Suno, everything you make is owned by Suno. Don't yes. do anything with it. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's like this weird ambiguity where it's like, even if you upload your own vocals or if you, you know, contribute components that are your own IP, there's this weird gray area. Cause again, even if you're using the pro, but you cancel your subscription, it seems as though you're supposedly not no longer able to monetize that or own the rights to it. And so where do you see the future of music ownership and IP in a world where there becomes so many more players that all have these really weird legalities around them. So one of the, there's two things here. So one is, um, of course, web, web two was mentioned, right? With platformization and, and, and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and, you know, WeChat and whatever. Um, they all built platforms that were made, uh, that were built around advertising, right? So they were selling our attention as a user to businesses that wanted to sell us ads. Um, and one of the things that all the AI tools are doing very differently is that we're all subscribing to them, right? Whether it was Midjourney or Dali, ChatGPT, you know, Suno, every single one of them, you you pay a subscription to use it. Um, so it's a totally different ball game. And um, so that's very interesting. So they're playing a different game than than Meta and everybody else was playing uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and then um, um, the second thing is that, um, and now I have to get my thoughts together. Um, the, ah, oh, see, now I forgot my second point. That's annoying, right? Um, remind me what you were saying, Brittany. Oh, I was just asking about, you know, in this world where there are like subscription based licensing, but then also where maybe you're utilizing oh, yeah, multiple tools yes. and, you know, who, who owns what, when, and I think it's going to become very tricky or convoluted. Yes. So what can artists or musicians or even product creators, you know, consider yeah. in this world? And the second thing um, is that um, around licensing and, you know, copyright ownership, um, we are going to see a lot of the major players battle it out, right? It's happening right now, um, even in between the, when we're recording this and when this is coming out, something could happen, right? That's how quickly everything is going. Um, and we have a few major cases in the US and in the UK that are, that are sort of due for resolving in, in the next couple of months, which are going to be super interesting to follow. Um, we have current platforms that come out of that sort of web two sphere, like Reddit, who have also always said like, Hey, I'm not responsible for anything that people upload, but I'm now capable of selling it though. Um, that, that is all very complicated. So there's a lot of tension there. Um, and one of the things that kind of drew me to blockchain is, um, that it allowed a, the potential at least to build something outside of the current system. So that might be accelerated. I mean, this is total blue sky thinking, but, um, what, what could happen is like copyright collapse, um, and it becoming totally ungovernable. And then we have to do something else. Right. Um, and, and I, I don't know what that is. Um, and, and probably you don't know what that is either. Um, but somebody might be building it right now. Who knows? Um, but that could be something that is happening that we get so lost in trying to, to litigate our way through the current, you know, conundrums of AI and all the copyright problems that it brings with it, that artists 
creators, people who make things start to say like, Hey, I fully own this. I made this, I record here, you know, on a blockchain or something that is immutable, <laughs> um, what, what, that this is mine. And, uh, and from there on, we, we, we take it into the world. So it could be a totally different ball game. Now for the, for the sake of helping explain the music industry and how utterly complex and insane it is, maybe you could detail out all the players involved. And I, I don't want this to be like a thesis or anything, but the, the, the rationale here is our, our previous guests keep alluding to that AI's best use case, best benefit is simplifying complex processes. And right now, if I'm a songwriter, I might then work with uh, a singer or a band and then distributors. Like, could you detail out the different steps that a smart contract or whatever you want to call it might need to manage in today's world? Um, so let's look at like a, a stupid set of rights that nobody ever considers neighboring rights. Yeah. These, these are part of, of copyright. Um, and, um, uh, the, the producer is, is responsible for them. So you, you, you know, we're in the studio, we make a song together. Um, you know, Brit Brittany is the producer, um, and, um, uh, she writes down, okay, in the metadata, boom, you know, we have these, these three people, we made music. Um, and then, uh, a bit later on when you're in post-production and, you know, the rest of us isn't there anymore, Brittany thinks, ah, oh, need a vocal. So um, she pulls in a singer, records a vocal and doesn't update the metadata because that was already done like two weeks ago. That's where it goes wrong. Um, and you know, a lot of people have said, you know, this, that, or whatever technology is going to fix all of this stuff, but that it won't fix that. Right. Um, and I, I, I don't see how we can fix that. That will always remain a problem. We'll also always have the problem of, of attribution, um, and always have the problem of, of really bad metadata. Um, that's not something that's going to be fixed by any technology. So instead of listing out like everybody involved, <laughs> I hope this example kind of helped understand how complicated it can be right at the start. And then it's not even out in the world yet. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, in doing research for this conversation, I was trying to find people working in that space because there's so many people working in, you know, smart contracting and rights management and copyright tracking when it comes to the legal field and, you know, more on the financial side of things. But there doesn't seem to be many people working in that space when it comes to music yet, which seems really surprising to me because music and then film and TV seem like they're ripe for that kind of contracting. Or that kind yes. of that kind of you know management that could be done in the back end through something like AI. Um. Yeah. H so how would you how would you imagine AI, you know, d doing that? Like, just as an automated yeah. tagging process, or I think part of its automated tagging process. Part of it is you know in the example of uh, a vocal track is actually identifying you know possibly like here's a list of people this could have been to say you know you should be like there's no attribution to that right now who should it be attributed to or to um, one of the things that AI from a process perspective is really good at and this is where the legal space has definitely been working in is trying to look through things and say what's missing or what seems like it's missing or what seems like it's not fully complete or correct and identifying mm -hmm. those things and flagging them. Um, so even from the simplest perspective of just identifying what's missing and flagging and asking someone to complete it. Yeah, I mean, there's there's um, infinite catalog that I'm thinking of that are doing that, um, that are working on that anyway. Um, you also have, you know, a big company like BMAT, um, which is sort of trying to figure out what's playing all the time everywhere. Um, and, you know, all of these companies to some extent use AI. Um, and that's great. And I think AI is fantastic for that. Um, whether we should call that AI or, you know, we should go back to referring to it as machine learning is up for debate. Um, but there you have it. So the, definitely 
you know, there's there's a role to play for that sort of stuff. Um, to actually, you know, make that work and implement that, everybody has to play the game. Um, and we we know people, right, who have tried that in the early days of, of the blockchain craze in the first phase, um, set out to, like, you know, recreate music rights and attribution. Um, it's a company called Jack, uh, J-A-A-K, if anybody's interested in looking them up. Um, they're great guys, um, still going strong, but not in that specific uh, uh, business because the, nobody wanted to play, right? That's the problem. If you want to actually change it, all the major players have to do it and they would lose power if they would. Yeah. So maybe let's continue looking ahead. It's clear there's a lot of challenges in being a musician today and being in the industry today. But if we look forward, what are some of the areas where some untapped positive um, things might happen? You know, let, let's say, for example, DSPs and the pr proliferation of, of audio tools enabled the rest of the world to participate, to create music, to have distribution, to be discovered. Like I can now find musicians who make a certain type of music from Senegal or Pakistan. That was never possible. I can collaborate with them remotely. Like these are magical things. What are some other potentially magical things that you can see happening on, on the front end of being an artist or the back end of being a business? Um, so I think um, the idea, for example, um, that the, um, the voice is becoming a new kind of tool in this. Um, and it, it's slightly different in the US than in, in, for example, in lots of places around Europe, because here, you know, we have moral rights and in the US you don't have moral rights, but um, um, for, for a lot of uh, US based musicians, it's, that's, that's a massive thing um, that they can own their voice. Um, so that's a, a really big opportunity. Um, and I think when it comes to, you know, stuff with stems is, is amazing. I think one of the things we have to realize is that um, the history of recorded music is not that long. The history of pop music isn't that long yet. Um, and, you know, ever since we recorded the first sounds, um, we've just been accelerating, accelerating, accelerating the amount of music that is recorded. Um, so another thing that is going to happen is that um, we're going to find more and more value in curation. Um, and this has historically also been the case, right? Because we've had people who put together concerts. We've had people who put together radio shows. We've had people who put together, you know, MTV shows and, <laughs> uh, and, and podcasts. You know, there's a lot of great, great forms of curation out there. Um, and doing that with, uh, with an intention is uh, going to be super important and building out sort of all the stories around that. So if you collaborate with a musician from Senegal and Pakistan, um, more than just um, the, the music as, as an end result, you'll probably um, be able to sort of tell that whole story um, and find ways to kind of distribute that story as well, you know, record the story and find audiences for that story. Um, but you will be fighting in a see of uh, other people who are trying to do that um mm -hmm. so to be able to find your niche is going to be super super important we we still thrive on the idea that there are certain individuals that we can follow that will tell us something is good and that we know that it's good um and and um that might be able to tell us like hey if you put these things together these different things together you'll have a new thing that's also nice um so op open your ears to that yeah, I just I also want to quickly for a moment um, take a step back to when you said before about the exciting thing about stems, and um, because I I don't know if a lot of people outside of you know musicians or 
very hardcore music space would really understand what that means. And I think as a non-musician, it's actually a really exciting space for the reason that you're saying about collaboration. So what this means is basically being able to take an audio file that is maybe mixed all together and actually create or pull apart the different layers of that song. And the most famous example of that being the Beatles releasing a new song where they pulled the vocal recording of John Lennon from a past from past audio files and collaborated from a demo, right? Yeah. So they not only were able to pull the stem from the demo of his vocal, but they were able to make it nice and good enough and so that clean it up and used in a yeah absolutely exactly. and so it brings a whole new meaning to the idea of collaborating because i think there was also like a a two-pack one that that came out as well where they pulled from uh a past song and have put out new music and and so it's not only collaborating globally but collaborating within the timeline as well within history which is kind of interesting for me we're collapsing time. <laughs> yeah, time is non linear anyway. So, you know, it's beautiful to have that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then thinking about, you know, if we want to talk about how people who are creating products or who are using these AI products can actually do something meaningful with them, you know, what is the place and the space for these smaller or mid sized artists and musicians who? want to use these tools like what should they be considering when thinking about which tools to start interacting with and engaging with so that they don't just become part of this open sea and instead can can elevate to your earlier to point them. read the terms and conditions um it's it's you never do this right you always click go and and one of the things that we're learning now is that we can't do that anymore if we're going to use these tools we have to we have to understand what's what's going on but i i think you know, a, a good place to to check out um, when it comes to these tools is uh, Water Music because they have this creative AI uh, database um, that they're continuously updating. Um, so if you want to dig in and you want to understand sort of how these things work in a better way, that's probably a really, really good place to go. And to try things, right? To see how it might work. I mean... Um, the, the DAW, so the Digital Audio Workstation, um, was due for an update, right? Um, that's That's been discussed for years on end now. Um, and AI is one of the ways that it's that it's now pushing forward as a tool. Um, and, you know, it will be more possible for people to work with, um, with tools like that um, because of this. And, you know, we will be able to collaborate with more people across different time zones and different times even, right? Um, so that's that's all something that I'm excited about. Um, but I'm also keenly, keenly aware of all the problems that this brings with it and that we need to kind of figure those out. Um, and I will keep stressing that. I, I want to look at the idea of, you know, artists who are in that upper tier versus everyone else, because one of the, the benefits of DSPs is that it enabled an entire next million or next hundred million of content creators to be to move from tinkerers to actual like actually distributed artists when we think about the experiments that let's say grimes or even a verite can do uh, they have that engaged audience they have a fan base they can experiment they can they can take on the risk of those experiments are there any opportunities that you're seeing for the everyday musician, the one who's just learning to explore, to do more, to take on more risk, to experiment in ways that, that have more upside? Um, I guess that depends on the kind of artist and the kind of person that you are. Um, if I'm being like fully honest, um, they're not all the same. Like not every artist is the same. If you're just, you know, playing around on a piano, um, playing around on your guitar, and that's the kind of music you want to make, go for it, right? Um, but if you want to think a little bit more about certain things, then try to figure out what that is that you want to think about, right? So there's two guys in the Netherlands, they started this thing called Open Culture Tech, um, where they work together with 10 artists um, and to help them with specific research questions. 
So this is all about emerging technologies. Um, AI definitely plays a role there, but a lot of other things as well. Um, and it doesn't do anything if you don't know what you're trying to answer for yourself, right? What are you trying to help yourself doing or creating or making or whatever? Um, so I think it's super important to kind of understand that. Um, and, you know, that's also why you need a good team. And that's also why it's probably good for artists to start thinking about everything they do as different projects. You can still just make an album and put it out. Um, but there is a whole different world out there where you can, you know, create worlds um, and with a lot of no-code tools, you can get very far in experimenting with that. And then at some point, you're going to need people with specific skills. So you need to find the people with those specific skills, bring them into your team, create a sort of a kind of co-ownership structure around the thing that you're creating, the music that you're making, the project that you're building, um, the world that you're going to want to nurture, and then push that forward. Um, but you you need to understand, you need to have that question. Right? You need to have that question and understand, like, why am I going to want to engage with a tool, a piece of tech, whatever? Yeah. So I, I want to ask a follow up to that because it, it raises a memory I've had of interviewing a couple musicians as part of that project. And one of them was just a classically trained musician who is just doing, you know, piano music and she just likes writing tracks. Then there was another person who call it whatever you want. Um, but this person learned how to basically surf algorithmic playlists and would do, you know, modern piano renditions of famous Christmas songs because you would get a lot of listens this way and you actually generate revenue. Now I'm, I'm thinking this question from the perspective of, well, what are the tools that these people needed to be successful? Was it that they need tools to better identify, um, you know, audiences? Is it to predict revenue opportunities? Is it to help them identify the right chords? What do you see AI as, AI as possibly being able to help these people uh, turn those hobbies into careers? It could probably help them on all of those points, right? It could help them um, create, set up a marketing plan. Um, it could help them build the necessary content to, to execute on the marketing plan. It can help them, you know, bring together a variety of ideas um, and, and push that towards um, a story that could be a, a set of songs or an album or something. Um, so it can help in every one of those ways if you know the question that you need answering with the help of AI or something else. If you're a musician and you want to go on a tour, um, one of the things you can do is look at your, you know, your Spotify for artists or your other for artists pages, um, and figure out where your listeners are, but that's, that only gets you one step of the way, right? Um, there's a bunch of other kind of algorithmic style things, AI driven tools, um, that can then help you kind of narrow down further who the people are that you could actually reach. Um, and then you still need to start DMing them and talking to them directly. That's not something that AI is going to do for you. So I've worked on several projects of so research and strategic consulting around analytics and data and how do we make that really meaningful and useful to people. And especially in the music space for these kind of everyday artists that don't have an understanding, they're just being served up analytics, but without any insight and without any recommendations or kind of assistance in what to do. And so I'm personally really excited to see, I think, AI um, enhance that space, like that assisting people in knowing what to do about the data, about their music and, and their successes or their, you know, failures or shortcomings, whatever. Um, what's something that you're really excited about seeing kind of taken from that web 2.0 into the, the next space now that we have more ability to make things meaningful? Yeah, well, I love what uh, something like uh, Westcott Media does with dynamic advertising. Um, so this is a step beyond, right? This is not like, Hey, how do I start out? This is how do I take the next step? Um, but they, they, they use all these kinds of things that you see 
on stock markets and just address them to um, the advertising flows in um, in the Web2 um, uh, platforms. You know, there's ways to make this work for you. Um, but then you know what the question is you want answered, right? Because you think like, hey, I want to reach a specific type of person in a specific market. What's the best time to do this? You know, and how do I make sure that when I put money towards that, it gets the best result? What do you see as some some signals, both positively and negatively, of what TikTok is doing to music and uh, just the music industry? Oh, boy. Um, um, so what TikTok did was um, really interesting with its For You page and its algorithmically driven, um, um, you know, front page where you would just get surfaced stuff no matter what. I mean, it's the, it was the logical endpoint uh, in moving from a chronological timeline to an algorithmic timeline. Um, and... I think the, the the combination of video and audio is super important, um, and I would love more people to kind of work on how those two things can create different stories to tell as well, um, which I think a lot of creators on TikTok do very very well. Um, but it's also capturing people within the infinite scroll, um, keeping them glued to a certain type of thing, um, namely the TikTok video. And yes, we see a lot of spikes of people, you know, searching for certain songs they hear on TikTok on DSPs, um, which is a net positive. Um, but in the end, no platform wants you to leave their platform. Um, that's just the way their business model works. Um, which is why you see everybody trying to make sure that everybody stays on their platform for as long as possible. Um, so that's probably the most negative thing is that in the end, the platform wants to capture you and keep you on its platform. Um, and everybody else creates the content to make sure that that happens. So to close things out, I'm hoping we can do a, a little prediction here. Obviously music's going to change. Um, you know, we, we're seeing the tools enable new capabilities for musicians. And, and one of the things that I, I was speculating about two years ago when we were working heavily in music was that generative music was going to result in hyper personalized music created for specific experiences, moods that you could own like a hundred variants of the same song, whatever it may be. That's a possible direction. Are there, any areas you speculated that music can transform into as a result of these new tools and capabilities? Um, I think it's going to transform into something we don't know and understand yet. Um, and I hope that we can push towards um, it becoming a lot of collaborative, creative efforts. Um, because I think that's one of the, the really beautiful things that could come out of this sort of shift that we're seeing now. Um, if we go back in history, right, music making was always this communal exercise. Um, listening has always been a communal exercise. If you look at the advent of radio, which was going to destroy the live music performance, the first people that were listening to radio were all doing it together, right? I mean, everybody banded together around the radio and listened to music. Um, so I think we might see a return in that. And I think there's certain people who are building very good tools towards us doing that as well, um, which is great. Um, but yeah, that that's sort of the future of music that I see. This is totally different, right? We'll, we'll, we'll still have like nostalgic albums, but we'll mostly just be um, creating music together a lot. Um, even though I'm like musically untrained, I can still join in, right? Whereas when I was like 15, I could just sit around while my friends were playing music. Um, that's not totally true, right? There were synthesizers I could play, but you know, you get the gist. Um, and now you go, you can just like do stuff and that will become, you know, maybe more haptic and all that sort of stuff, which could be very, very cool future.
Yeah, I wonder if it will, from like a behavioral perspective, will actually make music more meaningful to the people who maybe weren't as engaged with it before because it felt very distanced. Whereas now if you can start playing around and creating something that feels more personal, maybe it will bring a new meaning to music for people. It's a, yes. an idealistic thing I'd like to see. <laughs> it's, it's my kind of idealism. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Martin, uh, for joining. I really hope that we can get back to having amazing street performers. I, I miss that space making that they, they do on our cities and our places. And so much of travel, I swear, for me at least, is determined by what kind of music you feel and hear in the streets. I, I hope that this next evolution returns us to some of that. That sounds great. I would love to, I would love to go there with, uh, with, with you both and uh, everybody who's listening. Thanks for having me.